be about understanding the idea of hermeneutics. I understand that hermeneutics is not an ordinary, everyday word that uh, you have in your vocabulary, at least most of us do not. But I want to talk about hermeneutics and just grasping the concept, grasping the idea. I have to tell you that I lived a long part of my life before I knew, had any idea what the word meant or any appreciation for it. In short, hermeneutics is the science and art of biblical interpretation. If I use one synonym for hermeneutics, I'd say interpretation or biblical interpretation for two. There are three levels of general under, uh, hermeneutics or interpretation of the Bible. Uh, there's the grammar or grammatical level. And this is simply the study of, of words in a verse, in the sentence. It's, it's a language study in a sense, a very real language study. But the particular use of the language and how it's used uh, in verbs and adjectives and nouns and pronouns and all of these different parts of speech and moods like uh, uh, subjunctive uh, level or mood or, or various other aspects of language. We're looking at that here. And the Bible is a written book and is written in a language. It was written actually the Old Testament mostly, as you know, in Hebrew and some Chaldee. And then the New Testament is mostly in Greek and Matthew has some uh, Aramaic Chaldee in it. So the Bible is a book of literature, and it's been translated, thankfully for us, who speak mostly English over to here, and now we have it in English. And if you were doing this in Spanish, you still have a language, and language has parts of speech, and language is used mm -hmm. to communicate. And we have to understand the Bible's language, otherwise we won't get the message straight. And I'm going to get to this in a moment, but I want to just say right now, we have to get God's intended message. And that is our assignment, to convey what God had in mind to the people that we're preaching or teaching. And if there's a short circuit there, it's not a problem in heaven or even with the audience, it's in us. We have to be diligent students and concerned that we're getting the message. Well, if we cannot understand the language that he wrote it in the Hebrew, or it's in English for us, and sometimes we have, with the good helps we have, like James Strong's and some of these others, enabling us to go back and look at Greek and Hebrew words. But if we don't go there, and we don't understand what this passage is saying, how can we communicate that to an audience? or in that Seven Laws of Teaching, Milton Gregory has an excellent book on Seven Laws of Teaching, and it's old, but it's really, really good. And the Seven Laws, and one of them is, the teacher cannot teach that which he does not know. In a sense, we're teachers. Preachers are teachers of the Word of God. And if we don't know it, we can't communicate it. So it's so vital that we understand the grammar, the grammatical aspects of the Bible, and get the message for ourselves. And then we have the, the challenge, the uh, responsibility of putting it into our words, but not losing the meaning, communicating it without distorting the picture. Historical is the second level of these uh, three real big levels of general hermeneutics. And historical hermeneutics is simply referring to the level outside or apart from the context, including outside the biblical text even. And I guess just listed there geography and politics and customs and wars and culture and economy and commerce, and, and that list could go on long. But realizing that the accounts that are given in the Bible and even the exhortations like of Paul to the Corinthians or to the Ephesians or others, poems of David are written about something that's going on in a real world. These are not imaginary stories. You know that. And our job is not only to get what the verses are saying, the, the scriptures, the grammatical expression, the message, but 
now that message is given, why would he say it this way? Why would Paul be talking about and laying such emphasis upon sexual sins, fornication, concupiscence, and all that stuff to the Corinthians? Well, when you realize that Corinth was between two seas and that the ships, instead of going around, would sometimes hear laden and or park or, or come to uh, in port and they'd take materials over and, and the, whatever they were hauling over land over to another sea over here is a lot shorter they eventually put a canal through there but they didn't always have it but at any rate it's there and there's sailors coming and going all the time and Corinth is right there a city of commerce right behind the city is this prostitution house big one up there and these sailors and people are coming in travelers are going up there you can see this is a rampant problem in that day it helps if you know a little of the history I, I've just preached through the book of Esther and and this was tremendous eye-opening to me when I began to do a little historical research and Herodotus a Greek historian wrote a lot about what was going on and realized that that uh, Xerxes, the king, the Ahasuerus, that's the name of the king, but the personal name was Xerxes. Xerxes, uh, he was the son of Darius, wasn't it? Darius, who had fought the Greeks and lost. He came back to Shushan, where he was, defeated and determined to go back, the son did, and avenge dad. And so the first two chapters are talking about a historical event and this guy raising an army. He's having these feasts, he's bringing these people in so that, that he, he can get all these generals on board and they start building their war plans and they build a navy and they do all this. I found this out as I began to do the research and then I understand uh, why there's what seemed to me to be a disconnect between chapter 1 and chapter 2 in the book of Esther. Got all this planning, and then chapter 2 comes another feast. Well, he comes back home after he makes the campaign, raises his money, and gets his soldiers and does all this, and goes, and he's defeated again. And he comes back, and he, before he left, has gotten so upset with Vasti, his queen, he has disposed her. And then he goes off, and he gets without a woman for a while, and he's a womanizer. And so what does he do? He have a beauty contest, and all of a sudden, here is Esther in the middle of it. And then I begin to think, what is Esther doing in a beauty contest where she's virtually naked up here in front of all these people so she can win a one-night stand with a king and has a one girl every night just about? And I realize that Mordecai and Esther, they're not spiritual people. They're backslidden Jews. There's already been a, a, a declaration given so the Jews could go home. And Zerubbabel has taken a bunch. They could have every one gone back. And where should the people of God be? They should be in Jerusalem rebuilding the temple in the city. Last year, I, I mean, uh, Esther and... and uh, Mordecai stayed. They had a cush job. They got, it was comfortable. Boy, what about a picture today? People are comfortable with their jobs. I mean, so, but understanding the historical context is just so eye-opening. So you understand what's going on. You have to do that. I mean, you can't just get up, well, bless God, I felt like I had a text hit me last night, and I spent 20 minutes getting me a sermon ready. That won't fly very high very long, I can tell you, in most churches. It takes time to do research. But we're blessed in that you can get this stuff. I mean, we are have an Internet out there that's full of sources that you understand 100 years ago our forefathers couldn't do this very well. But we are, to whom much is given, much is required. I believe God expects the best preaching to be in us in this generation. Those of us who have all these tools and who have can do it. But you know what the devil will do? He will fill your life so full of urgent things 
Somebody's sick. Somebody's griping. Somebody's moaning. You need to go to a preacher's conference. <laughs> you feel your life so full, you'll think you're doing God a service if you spend two hours a week on a sermon. And I will tell you, that's cheating God. That is downright cheating God. You can't do it that way. It won't where you have to do preparation and you have to do delivery and you have to prepare to deliver or your delivery will fall flat every time. So, a literary is a third area here of hermeneutics. That is, a passage or a whole book, an extended passage. We're going to look at it a little more a little later, but the Bible has lots of different styles of language. Some of it is flat out what we call prose, historical uh, accounts. First Samuel, most of numbers. Just historical account. These people marching here, they're doing this, you know, and this is the next king, king, king. But there's, some of the Bible is not historical, although it has some history in it. Some of it is poetry. I mean, the Psalms are just poetry, and so are the Proverbs, and so is the Song of Solomon. And you get to the Song of Solomon, and he's talking about all these horses and all this stuff going, and you think, what in the world? You've got to get the kind of language you're talking. I mean, if you're talking in poetry, that's one thing. We understand that has its own rules. If you're talking in prose, that's another thing. We're talking apocalyptic literature, the revelation. I saw a white horse and a pale horse. That's, that's not, not the same kind of talk. Just being honest. If you're going, to, you're going to do background work, and that's what hermeneutics is. It's seeing what's going on and putting it in the right view getting things together. You have to understand and do a literary uh, uh, evaluation as well. Now the orthodox rule, this I want to say, because this to me was most potent when I first encountered this. The orthodox rule of biblical hermeneutics is this. The correct meaning of any passage is always the author's intended meaning. And who's the author? Well, it's God. And if we don't get what God meant, we miss the point. I'm going to tell you, to go and misrepresent God to a church on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, and you're preaching something that God didn't intend, I believe it's not going to go so well at the judgment seat of Christ. We have to take this work seriously. It's God's word. And so we have to get his meaning, and that requires some digging. I found out when I was taking English courses at Stephen F. Austin University that the professor never let me off if I didn't give him the right meaning. <laughs> I'd read Chaucer or somebody, and, and he'd ask us questions on that novel we read or on that poetry we read, and, and, and it didn't improve my grade point one bit to just guess at it. I needed to get what was meant, and he was there to make sure I got the right meaning out of what the author wrote. How much more so in this wisdom with God? I need to find out what God's saying here. And I'm probably not going to do that by just reading it three or four times and getting up with some good ideas and telling a few jokes. I'm not going to have it. Also, I want to talk about two words here that all of us need to always, in our preparation and delivery, especially in preparation, keep very clear and focused. One of them is exegesis. Most of you know that word. It means to come out of or to reveal or declare what is already there. Out of, exegete, bring it out. What is there? You tell me what is in there. Isn't that what we're supposed to do when we preach? We're going to preach the Word of God. I'm going to tell you what is in here. So the exegesis is bringing the message out of, but the opposite word, the answer to them here is eisegesis or eisegete. And it means to read into or impose or bring in something that is not already there. And that is a lot easier to do than even to say. <laughs> it's easy to say, but I'm telling you, when you say something that's easier said than done, this is easier done than said. It's real easy to have your mind made up on something already, and you're going into a scripture, you're going to read it in there whether it's there or not. That is wrong. That is absolute dishonesty. And let me tell you, any educated person in your audience is thinking with you and picks that up is going to turn everything else you say off to. When they see you become dishonest with the Scripture. Some of you were over at the missions conference here at Garland 
a month or two ago. And I think it was Brother Travis Jones pointing out that in this age where everybody seems to have a cell phone, I mean the kids have cell phones. And the cell phones have all these apps. They can do research and are. While you're up there preaching, they're sitting back there with their phone and you make a claim that so-and-so said this or some fact you say and they've already checked you out and you're not even on to the next point in your sermon. And when they check you out and find out that you lied to them, they're going to wonder what else you'd lie about. All of a sudden, your credibility just goes. We have to be good students. We have to tell the truth. And we have to go to a text and we have to bring out what's there that's provable, people can see it, and we have to not import our preconceived notions. I am so against baptism and regeneration. I mean, I don't believe that anybody ever got their sins washed away in a river or a lake or a baptistry, but every church of Christ you over here at Abilene and everywhere else believes in baptism and regeneration. And I'm, I have a preconceived notion against it. So naturally, if I'm reading through the Bible and I find the scripture, like whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved, I already know it doesn't mean baptism for regeneration. And I think I'm on solid ground. I think all of you here and me probably know this too. However, I ought to be honest enough to say, I'm not going to say that's not what he's talking about just because I don't believe in baptismal regeneration. I ought to say I don't, I don't believe that because I've studied it and I, I see what it does mean. It's easy to read in. And that's an easy one because we all are against baptism and regeneration. But there's a bunch of others where we can really find ourselves already knowing before we went. My mind is already made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> oh, me? You know what I'm talking about. This is what I mean. We cannot allow that to come into our preaching. We cannot. Since the oldest book of the Bible was written approximately 3,800 years ago, a little longer, and the last book was about 1,900 years ago, there are four gaps that especially demand hermeneutical work because we're looking at the Bible that ended way back there. So here they are, and I've listed them on the sheet. Historical, that is, what was going on back then. Cultural, what on God's green earth was David doing walking on the top of his house at night? Well, they didn't build houses like subdivisions in McKinney, Texas. They built flat roofs and had patios up there. Sometimes it was cool up there at night, and they'd go up there and hang out. That's what he was doing when he saw by sheep. If you don't understand something about the culture, that won't make any sense to people out there. What is he doing on top of his house at night? And most of us who've been around the Bible a long time like me, I just hear it, and I just... I just I've heard that so many times, I don't even question it. But you think a lot of these new people out of there, they're questioning everything. I mean, that don't make sense to me. We have to put ourselves in the mindset of where's that student? And I have to understand, I've got to communicate this message to that person in this new world of new thinking. Linguistic, that is, again, language, those issues, and then philosophical. Philosophical. I'm not going to get into the Calvinist and Arminian argument here but you have a philosophical position especially in a Calvinism it's a what they consider to be logical philosophical view if this means that that means this that means that then it, then it has to be this well uh, we need to look at that sort of thing I won't go into that much more but let's move along uh, scripture has one meaning but it may have many applications I had to put that in. Uh, whatever the Bible has written, has written, it's written, it's talking about an event or it's talking about something that did happen, going to happen, uh, some idea or truth at hand. One, when you say that this scripture has two meanings, well, now who's going to figure that out? You got yourself off into a quicksand big time. No, it has one right meaning. Now, applications... It was written to the church in Corinth, but it's applicable to Midway Baptist Church in McKinney, Texas. Lots of applications. Truth, application to a job, 
house divided against itself cannot stand. Now it applies to work ethics. I mean, a, a workplace. It applies to a home. It applies to a church. It applies to a lot. Not an application, but one truth. Also, when the literal sense of a scripture makes sense, seek no other sense. That is just a fundamental law of hermeneutics, and just a good one to keep right and clear for you. And I assure you that a lot of people don't believe that. The whole debate over creation versus evolution, at least from the theological, the seminary sides, those who believe in theistic evolution and those types, most all of them will deny this particular rule of hermeneutics right here. You know, the literal sense. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth and so on, right through Genesis chapter 1. It makes sense. Why should you seek some other sense? I said, no, that's not, can't be literal. It's uh, figurative. That's figurative language. And therefore, it's not a real atom. It's just a representative of humanity. And, I mean, they just go on with all this watering it down and watering it down. When the literal sense makes sense, when Jesus said, I am the vine. Well, now, you know he was not a great vine. He was a human being. He was in the flesh. They crucified him. So there are times when there are language you realize the literal sense doesn't make sense. You realize he's got a truth. He's making a point. He's like a vine. But you have to be, it's not always easy to tell. But it must concern us. Where is this going to concern us most? Not when we're up there waxing eloquent in that pulpit. It's going to concern us most when we're in that study and nobody's looking. And we're tired. It's easy to go to sleep, you know. We are talking how easy, especially if you've got sleep apnea or something, and you get in there, you start reading, and in 15 minutes you feel like <laughs> you wake yourself up. But there's where it has to happen, in the study. That's in the preparation part. Hermeneutical analysis. And I will get through here pretty quickly. Four primary analyses which should always be applied in scriptural research. This is in the study. I say that again, in the study. Four primary analysis. Number one, a historical cultural analysis. Historical, cultural, and contextual. You could make five out of these if you want to make contextual in its own self, but uh, in the context of the things that are going. You understand that all of the Bible even in the New Testament part, was in an agriculture or what we would call an agrarian society. They raised crops. They were raising wheat and running sheep around the mountains and doing that kind of work. Can, can you imagine uh, bringing King David to Houston, Texas? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> All these freeways and these cars. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul going into a textile mill <laughs> Or into an assembly plant and a car, you know, where they make automobiles. It's a different world. We're, an ag we're not an agricultural society. There's a lot of agriculture, but we're an industrial society. There's a world of difference between those two societies. Understanding that the Bible is written in a day when there's a whole different culture, different kind of everything going on. But truth is truth, whether it's back then or whether it's now. And our objective is to get the truth out of here in an in an, in an agricultural age and bring it here where it, a guy that's never seen a cotton bowl would understand it. Did you see a commercial here a while back, about two years ago, about Idaho potatoes? And they had, they had these uh, people going out and picking potatoes off of a plant. And that was just a commercial, but I mean, it's, my kids, grandkids, not my kids, but my grandkids, they've never, never seen a potato and know how it works. I was after Brother Colin Hurst just last week or two ago, and he was talking about somebody that's out there in the church past, and that he had uh, somebody helped him with a garden. And he asked him how it went, and he said everything went just fine except the potatoes. I never got any potatoes. And he went out there to look, and all potato, he said all the potato plants died, and he said they just never did produce any potatoes. I'm talking about out here at Pickneyville, Illinois. 
the guy said, come here a minute. He began to dig and dug all these potatoes. The guy didn't, he didn't know that potatoes grow under the ground and not on a plant. You don't pick them like you pick figs or apples. You, know? you say, well, boy, that's, that's kind of comical. And I thought it was rather comical. However, there are, most of our kids don't understand this Bible talk about sheep and shepherds and sowing and reaping and stuff like that. It's not so common to them. What's your job? What's my job as a preacher? Is to take those wonderful truths and bring them over here where it's as clear as day without distorting the truth. That, that takes work. You don't just get up because you're real smart. And I'm so good, I can just do it off the cuff. It won't work that way. No wonder so much preaching is shallow. And you can hear a guy start and realize you can go ahead and start reading your daily Bible readings here while he's preaching. Because you'll get more out of that than you would what he's got to say because he's not going to say anything. You already kind of see it. Just going to repeat. You ought to do this. You ought to do that. How many sermons you have? You ought to do. Well, yeah. But tell me. Let the Word of God tell me I ought to do that. Don't you just tell me and nag on me all this time. There was a guy. He's in heaven now. He was not a preacher. He was a Sunday school teacher. If you heard him the first time, you'd say, this is the best teacher I ever heard. And the second time. But if you heard him the seventh time, you'd say, that sounds familiar. Because he would go over in a Sunday school class the same six lesson just over and again. He just rehashed it. But it was essentially the same stuff. And I've heard preachers, if you've heard them once or two times, you can go anywhere. They can start at any text, anywhere, and they always come right back to where they were. They never, it's never follow the text. They got something on their mind. It's isogeating it. What you say may be true. It may be needed. But if it's not in the text, it's dishonest. You don't preach what you have in mind. You preach what the Bible says. That's hermeneutics. And that is expository preaching, which in our next session we're going to look at in greater detail. So, a historical contextual analysis, a lexical syntactical analysis, that is the language, the type of language, what mood, past tense, present tense, such. A theological analysis, that is, overall, what does this look like overall? I mean, is, is this what I'm preaching here in Romans? Does it agree with what's taught in Leviticus? Because it has to, you know, Bible's one book, and it's all in agreement. And then a, a literary analysis. Literary. By the way, when you start doing this and you're getting it right, it, you know what it does? It makes sense. It has that logic to it. it, it people begin to realize this is strength. There's power to this thing. Understanding historical cultural analysis, and I'll just run quickly through here. How could history impact the understanding of a passage? Well, it can. You read the book of Esther, and I assure you it does. In what ways does the culture of the Bible days differ from current culture? Well, I've just been talking about one thing. They were agriculture, and we were industrial. A lot of difference. None of them ever saw a TV. Would have never believed one could happen. Why is context so important to proper interpretation of the Scriptures? Well, because God's true all the way through, and the Bible doesn't contradict itself. You have to keep things in context. Understanding a lexical syntactical analysis. In what sense should every word in Scripture be understood? Every word's important. All the words of God. So what are the meanings? What does that word mean, and what are the... Similarities between other words. How does it fit? Is this a verb or is it a noun? Or what is it? And so you look at the words. And then syntax. Again, that's usually the, the moods and various other uh, unique ways that words work together. And then tools that help with the analysis. Don't be afraid to use a concordance. Don't be afraid to use a Bible dictionary. Goodness, uh, James Strong is best most available. I don't say it's the best necessarily. I think it's good. But it's it's there. You can get it on a free download right onto your computer. And you can go over there and you can see the word in Hebrew or in Greek and you can see exactly what uh, he says. And if you want to get into it deeper and say, I would like to know a little more about that word and maybe its etymology, where did it come from, how did that word 
uh, arrive, go to somebody like A.T. Robertson. His word pictures or word studies in the New Testament there. W.E. Vine's got a lot of good stuff. And there's, there's good helps. You know, we, we do not have to invent the wheel. It's already been invented. And we can help with other things, but why not use tools that are there, that are good, that have been proven tools through the years? And understanding a the theological analysis. Well, uh, we could talk about salvation history, and that's a big thing when you get to looking at it more. And then dispensationalism, I think, uh, again, you, you know about uh, dispensations, and I believe in some dispensations, but you've got to be careful how much you swallow of everything. Just look before you buy the whole package. Uh, I found that very few things are 100% pure except the Bible. <laughs> Most everything has a few. You learn how to eat the chicken and throw those bones away. And then covenant theology. That's a big thing. You know, there's a lot of the uh, denial of the Jews and things that come out of covenant theology today and, you know, taking away and not playing behind Israel. And then a, a literary analysis, the importance of understanding the type of literature in of any given Bible passage and the three prominent genres of Literature in the Bible are prose, just plain old historical accounts. And there's poetry, like so many of those middle books are. And then there's prophetic language. We have the prophets, and especially the apocalyptic literature of the Revelation. And then there's figures of speech that come in here. And figures of speech in English and figures of speech in Hebrew or Greek are not always exactly the same. But there are similes. You know, things where you see like and as, as is the mother, so is the daughter, like as. And then the metaphors, which are uh, not so like and as, but they're, they're little truths that communicate an idea, like little analogies that are made. Ironies, things that seem to be contradictory, or strangely put together, paradoxes, uh, opposites, personification, or a you know, wisdom, like in the Proverbs, is like a, in a person. Wisdom hath her voice, and so on. So there's all these figures of speech that have to play into preparing. And then an extended simile, just to give you some quick looks, an extended simile is called a parable. An extended metaphor is called an allegory. A compressed parable or allegory is called a proverb. The longest book in the Bible is a book of songs about all things. And the two most common types of psalms are praise psalms and lament psalms. There's a lot of, you know, psalms is a great book. Hebrew poetry achieves poetic flow by repetition, comparison, and contrast of thoughts. In English, it's that pentameter, you know, five things and something. I mean, we do not so in Hebrew. You, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's poetry. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall. You see the connecting of thoughts here. And I will tell you, the, the three, there are three main types of parallelism in Hebrew poetry. And I will just tell you that you might want to write down, because they're not in the notes, I don't think we got them in the notes in time, is synonymous poetry. Uh, that is when two, when a thing is compared, you have two statements that are just alike, or not exactly worded the same, but the same idea. Synonymous poetry and then there's antithetic, A-N-T-I-T-H-E-T-I-C, antithetic Hebrew poetry. That's when you have two ideas instead of being synonymous ideas, they're contrasted ideas. One's opposite of the other, but they're parallel thoughts on the same issue. And then the third is the climactic uh, uh, comparisons where you have two together and one really does excel at, at the top of the climactic. That's worthy of study, fellas. I will tell you, really, really worthy of study. Particularly if you're going to do a study in the Psalms, you have to get into that. And then the type of Bible literature that makes the greatest use of symbols is called apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature is normally prophetic in nature. It's talking about things to come, like the book of the Revelation. And once a student has a analyzed a passage and exegeted the meaning, he, he should do these things. He should verify the validity of his work by comparing his finding with others who have spoken with authority on the passage. And I'm just talking about a safeguard. If you think you're the smartest kid on the block and the brightest light that's in the room of late, 
And all of the, what you've got is just some new something from, it wouldn't be a bad idea to consider some real trusted, well-known authorities to see what they said about that very passage that you think you got the greatest line on in the world. <laughs> and if you're left foot first, and they're all right foot first, you might want to consider. They may have had some. I may be right, but then there's a pretty good chance that I'm not. Maybe I better rethink it. This is especially true when things like in a study of of prophecy. You know, we got these prophetic events and some talk about a rapture and a tribulation and a appearance of the Lord in, in glory and the setting up the millennial kingdom and, you know, those events. So you come up with some better idea. You better look it over. You might ought to go see that Pentecost book and read on it a while and some of these other books because they were not all dummies, and they spent some time in the book, too. And to think that you're smarter than all of your compadres all around the world for 20 years, I mean, 2,000 or even 1,000 years, 500 years, is pretty, pretty cocky. You got to just think, uh, maybe I better listen to somebody. I may be right. I may see something they didn't see. But it's a good thing to compare your findings with some other findings before you run up on a flagpole because once you get up on a flagpole and start preaching it and then you got something to defend. If you didn't see you're wrong, you gotta say I was wrong. <laughs> and that's not in our vocabulary, is it? <laughs> say I was wrong, not me. He should identify, after you've done your work, the timeless principles of the text with a view of accurately conveying them to a contemporary audience. Yep. You've done all this work, but as we're going to see in just a bit, you're not ready to preach yet. you just done, I don't, done a lot of work. You understand a lot of things you didn't, but you haven't put it together in a presentable way. And then, once that student's analyzed the passage and exegeted the meaning, he should realize that at this point he has done nothing to prepare his findings for presentation to the audience. Just got the facts out there. Just got something to preach, but I'm not ready to preach it. And under that, he should therefore be aware that his work is far from over. When you get through with your research, your work's not near. I did a lot of hours of research before I wrote this little book called The History of Churches. Lots of hours of research. But when I had all the research, it didn't make it a book. <laughs> I had to write it, and I had to put it together in some fashion, you know. Well, that's the way it is, maybe to not that quite extent, but in preaching, you, you, you do all this work and it's wonderful, but then you gotta figure out how am I gonna communicate it honestly to this audience. And before him now is the tremendous responsibility of organizing and presenting the message of God to his audience without distortion. Did you hear it? Without distortion. That's the hard part, to say it clearly, because just keep in mind you got an audience paying attention. Some of them know a few things. But uh, most of all, God is listening to your sermons. He knows what he meant. Okay, messenger, you gonna say it what I said? Or are you gonna distort my message to these people and say it, you did it in the name of God? <laughs> to me, that's a fearful, I mean, it's awesome. It's a fearful thought to realize that I would misspeak for God. After all, we're speaking for him. Thank you.